All right, thank you. So today we continue in our series in the book of Revelation, uh, getting into chapter 7. Before we get to uh, this chapter, let me remind you that last week we saw Jesus opening up the seals of the scroll. So that scroll that he had received from the Father in the throne room of God, he begins to open it up, breaking those seals. And with each seal that he breaks open, there is a corresponding series of events that happen on the earth. And so we saw uh, the first four, kind of those horses of the apocalypse, uh, the war and the economic turmoil and the famines and death. And then we had Christian martyrdom and then the cosmic disturbances representing uh, the end of the world is a upon us or is, is happening, and, and so Jesus is opening this up, and these things are happening in the world, and I suggested to you that uh, what is happening in this passage is uh, God is showing us the consequences, the natural consequences of evil, that when humanity, when people turn away from God and reject God, this is what happens. There is war. There's disease, there's famines, there's uh, political uprisings, there's economic turmoil, there's uncertainty in the world, there's death. And so these are the things that happen when the world rejects God, when the world refuses to obey God. Uh, But God in his mercy is allowing these things to happen before the end to show people, look, this is what humanity is like without me, but will you repent? Will you put your faith in me? Will you put your trust in me? And these kinds of events, whether it's death or wars, have a way of waking people up to their need for God. And so God in his mercy is giving people before the end a chance to repent and to be saved. He's using these things to draw people to himself. I mentioned to you that One of the main lessons for us as a church is our need to be patient. He talks to the Christians who have been martyred and says, wait, wait until the end. Continue to be patient. Our need to persevere in the faith, to maintain our faith, to continue to be faithful to Jesus in the midst of the things that are happening in the world. And no matter what goes on in the world, no matter what scary things we see on the news, the call here is to Maintain your faith in Jesus. Continue to trust in Jesus. Right? He's not necessarily the one who's causing people to go to war against each other, but he allows it to happen as part of his plans. And so we continue to trust in Jesus no matter what. Now, the other thing I want to remind you of is the week right before last week, so not chapter 6, but chapter 4 and 5, we saw that these scrolls, these plans, come from the throne room of God. And I reminded you or told you that it's absolutely essential as we go into the rest of this book that we remember where they came from. They came from the throne room of God. They came out of the holiness of God. And we saw that word holy being repeated over and over again by the angels. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. It is out of the holiness of God that these things come. But then we also saw Jesus As the sacrificial lamb, the slain lamb, who is the one who opened it. He is justified in opening these things because he came first out of love and mercy, sacrificing himself for us out of his great love for us to save those who would put their faith in him. Now today, in getting into chapter 7, I believe what chapter 7 is all about is it forms what is uh, sometimes called an interlude, or or theologians call this kind of a pause or an interlude in the narrative, in uh, the six seals, right? We don't see the seventh seal opened yet. Instead, we take kind of a break. And if you remember in week one, I told you to kind of think of Revelation a little bit like uh, watching a movie on TV where every now and then you're going to get a commercial break, right? So this is kind of like our commercial break. There's an interlude. There's a pause in the string and the narrative uh, that is happening. And God wants to remind us of something really important uh, as we look at the six seals and then as we go into the seventh seal and the things that will happen next. There's something absolutely vital that he wants to remind you of, and so he's going to give you this interlude today and show us this uh, very important picture today that helps ground us and reassure us in light of all the things that he's showing that are coming or that are happening. 
Uh, now, the question I want you to be thinking about today as we go through this is, what does it mean to be sealed in Christ? What does it mean to be saved? What part does God play in saving us and in maintaining our salvation? And what part does he call us to play in continuing to be in the faith, to persevere in the faith? So think about those questions and we'll circle back around to them at the end. Getting into our chapter then. Sorry, that was the review. Uh, Verse 1 of uh, this chapter starts off by saying, After this I saw, and I mentioned to you, I believe this is an interlude or a pause in the narrative. And whenever John says something like, After this I saw, or after this I looked, what he's saying is there is kind of a, a break, and I'm seeing something different now. I was looking at this, but after that I saw, I looked at something different. So there's this break. And any time he used that phrase, that's your transition phrase. It's not saying, this is what happened exactly next. It's saying, this is what I saw next. So after this I saw, or after this I looked, you'll circle that word. Anytime you see it in Revelation, it represents a transition, a change in what John is seeing. Kind of like changing the channel on your TV, right? There was something different that appeared before me. And so it's a break in the common narrative. And he says, After this I saw four angels at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds. Now, you guys know that three times four equals 12. And so this 444 represents kind of the wholeness or the completion. This is something that is going to encompass the whole earth. And it's these angels holding back the winds that... We are told in verse 2, have power to harm the land and the sea. And later in verse 14, it's going to talk about a great tribulation that is coming on the earth. And so these are angels that are holding back a great tribulation, a great destruction that will come over the whole earth at the end. But right now they're holding it back. They're stopping it from coming and from happening. And John then sees a fifth angel come out and that fifth angel tells these other angels, keep holding it back. Don't unleash this wind of destruction. Don't unleash the great tribulation just yet. Keep holding it back. And he says you have to keep holding it back until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. And so until everyone has been sealed that God intends to have sealed as part of his kingdom. Now if you look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12 through 13, Paul says, "And you also, speaking to the church, speaking to the Gentile Christians, you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit." So here John is talking about salvation. He's talking about a group of people that are meant to be saved and God delaying and waiting to unleash these four winds until the number of people that are meant to be saved are saved. Until every individual that is meant to be saved has been brought into his kingdom. And so they're holding it back. They're delaying. Again, out of mercy, God is waiting so that more would be drawn to him, so that more would be saved. He then looks and he sees a great number of people, 144,000 people. And it says these are people sealed from the tribes of Israel. Now, there are different interpretations as to who these, uh, this group, this 144,000, represent. Uh, most interpretations, just about every interpretation, believes this is not a literal number. It's more of a symbolic number. Uh, but there's a few different ideas of what this group could represent. Uh, one interpretation, one idea is that this group represents historical uh, Jews prior to Christ who were brought into the faith, who were, who were uh, saved through their faith in God. And so if you look at Hebrews, the heroes of the faith, uh, the hall of faith, right? it's kind of referring to the Hebrews, the Jews that were saved through faith in God prior to Christ. And the reason they believe that is because the next picture is going to have a multitude from every nation, tribe, culture. And so they think, well, historical Jews in the faith and then Christians through faith in Jesus. And so maybe that's what is being shown to us here. Now what's interesting, if you think about the historical Jews and the people of Israel, uh, and then you look at the list that they have, uh, there's a couple edits to that list of the tribes of Israel. One of the edits, this list is given to you in order of their birth, except for the fact 
that Judah is put first. Now, Judah was not the firstborn of Jacob. Reuben was. And so why does Judah jump from like fourth up to first? Well, one of the reasons uh, might have to do with, if you go back to Chris's sermon a while back, Chris talked to you about all the different uh, children of Jacob and the sins that they had and the mistakes that they made and who ends up being more of a leader than the others and a spiritual leader. And so it might have to do with some of that and some of the sins and mistakes that they made. Uh, But another reason that Judah is first here is because Jesus came out of the tribe of Judah, right? David came out of the tribe of Judah, and so this tribe jumps to the first, to the, to the uh, prominent seat as the chosen group because this is where Jesus came from. Now, another edit that was made in this list is that instead of uh, the child uh, named Dan, there's a tribe called Manasseh, or Manasseh and uh, Dan is omitted, and instead Manasseh is put in there, and Manasseh was a child of Joseph, And none of the other tribes are grandkids, but here we have a grandkid given the prominence instead of Dan. And uh, theologians believe the reason for that is because the tribe of Dan historically turned to idolatry. They basically stopped following Judaism, stopped following God, and were worshiping idols and were worshiping false gods. And so uh, the belief here is that they are omitted from this list because they they forsook God. They abandoned God and started pursuing idols instead. And so here we have somebody replacing that tribe, uh, showing us, look, uh, if you reject God, if you forsake God, then, then you miss out on the opportunity of being in God's family, in God's kingdom. Now, another interpretation of this group is rather than historical Jews, there's a, a thought that maybe this is future uh, Jewish people who become Christians, so Messianic Jews. So in the end times, there's different verses that talk about a remnant of Jews that are brought into the kingdom. And so uh, Christians or Jews today who are becoming Christians, becoming Messianic Jews, that God has a certain number of uh, Messianic Christians that will enter into the kingdom from Israel, from uh, the Jewish uh, uh, family line. And he has this in mind as we draw closer to the end. Again, That number of 144,000 is believed to be uh, more symbolic than literal. And so there's a symbolic representation of a wholeness, a completion of Jews coming to faith in Jesus and being saved. And then the third possibility here for this 144,000, some think, well, maybe this is just a symbolic number representing the fullness of the Christian family. Any, any Christian, no matter whether they're Jewish by heritage or not, uh, coming into the faith, sealed in Christ uh, in the last days, in the end times, and bring brought into the kingdom. And what they're saying here, or, or what they say this is saying then, is that uh, that is the true Israel, right? Those who believe in Jesus, that is the true family of God, and they're brought into the kingdom, and they are sealed in Christ through the Holy Spirit uh, through the message of the gospel. So uh, regardless of which one of those you believe, and I would uh, line up probably more with the second one, uh, the remnant of Jewish Christians coming into the faith in the end times, the main point here is that there is a group, it's a large group, and it is a, a specific group that God has in mind that will be saved in the end times. And when that group is brought into the kingdom, then it's time for God to release the winds release the end time uh, things that are going to happen. But that will not happen until those people that God has intended to be saved are saved. This takes us then into the next little passage, the next little uh, picture. And again, John says, after this I looked. And so we're changing the channel, right? Slightly different vision, slightly different group. And this time he's looking and he sees in heaven a great multitude, more numerous right, than anybody can count. And so whereas that first group, you could count it, it was specific. This second group is so big, so large that nobody could count it. So millions and millions and millions. And the emphasis here is that these people come out of every tribe and nation and people group and uh, language. And so if you remember uh, last week, I talked about the words of Jesus, that there will be people in his kingdom from every tribe and culture and nation. And the word for nation is ethne. It means people group. So every ethnicity, every people group will be there in heaven. And uh, think about John here. Right, John, who's been exiled for sharing the gospel, 
The gospel uh, has been going out with great effectiveness, but is still relatively small, right? We're talking about Christians in the thousands, maybe tens of thousands spread out across uh, that Roman Empire there, uh, but no further than the Roman Empire, right? And for John to have this picture here of a countless number Millions and millions strong from all kinds of tribes, people that he's never even seen or thought about or ever even knew was in existence. He's seen right these different headdresses. He's seen the different colors of skin. He's seen all these different languages being spoken. And he's like, I had no idea the gospel could go this far. I had no idea it would encompass that many people. Right? Picture that scene for John, right? soaking that in, going, wow. The gospel is going to reach millions and millions and millions of people. And so we have here the picture of all of the saints, all of the people who are brought into the kingdom of heaven because of the gospel being preached. And so this is a picture of really the end of it all, the end result of everything. The people of God brought into God's kingdom brought into heaven, and then worshiping Jesus. And it says that they're standing before the throne. And this is really important for us because in the last chapter, uh, the people of the earth, as everything was happening all around them, they started crying out and saying, who can stand before the wrath of God? And here we have the people of God standing before the throne. And so it's like the question is being answered. Who's going to stand before God? Who can stand and withstand the wrath of God? Well, those who are in Christ, those who believe in Jesus, those who are saved. And it goes on and says that they are dressed in white robes, representing that righteousness, that cleansing, that purity, the redemption that we have in Christ says that they're holding palm branches and worshiping God and worshiping Jesus, right? Where else do we see palm branches in the Bible? We see it at Palm Sunday, right? And the crowds were worshiping Jesus as the Messiah, as the King, but then they all abandoned him. Here we have the true servants of Jesus who never abandoned him, and they're worshiping him as the true King of the universe. So waving those palm branches, laying them before him. Then from there, we see them begin praising Jesus. And they say, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Salvation. Who does it come from? Salvation comes from God. Comes from the Lamb. This is where we get our salvation. From God, from Jesus Christ. And then as they burst into song, we have the elders and the other angelic creatures burst into song. And they say, Amen. The word amen means, may it be so. May this happen, Lord. Help this to come to pass. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So they repeat that again. Amen. May this come to pass, Lord. May this happen as you have decreed. In the middle of this worship service, then, uh, there's one of the elders that turns to John and uh, somewhat uh, facetiously, he turns to John and says, hey, uh, who are these people, right? Who are these people in the robes? Who are these people, this great multitude, right? And, uh, and it says that the guy already knows the answer to that. And John says, you know, right, who they are. And so he's asking this question because he really wants to emphasize this point. God really wants us to know. And all throughout Revelation, this is going to be the case, right? There's a lot of stuff that is a little bit uncertain, a little bit confusing. Who does this represent? What does that represent? But the stuff God really wants us to know, he makes clear. He explains, and he really wants us to get who is this great multitude, and so he then explains it, and the guy says, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Who are the people who will be before the throne of God? Who are the people who are welcomed into the kingdom, into heaven? Those who have come out of, those who have withstood, those who have endured through the tribulations of this world. Those who have maintained their faith in Jesus no matter what came their way. It then says, they washed their robes in white by the blood of the Lamb. The emphasis here is that they washed 
their robes. Now we understand, we know, we receive the robes through Jesus' death on the cross, right? He takes our filthy rags and gives us His robes of righteousness, but they wash the robes means that they continue to maintain their faith in Jesus, even through the sufferings, even through the persecutions, even through the difficult things that happen to them, the difficult things of this world. They didn't give up. Paul will talk about the fact that we identify with Christ when we go through sufferings. When we go through sufferings, we take on the sufferings of Christ in ourselves. It's, it's one of the ways that God binds us and draws us close to Him and, and helping us understand and identify with what Jesus went through and did on the cross. So that's the picture we have here of these multitudes who washed their robes. They continued to maintain their faith. They identified with Christ even in the face of great suffering. The elder then goes on and says, Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. Notice, it's a reward to serve God. It's a reward to serve Christ. It's not a punishment. He says, And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 4 says, His banner over me is love. Those who follow Christ, those who honor Christ, God spreads His banner, His tent over them. The tent, the umbrella, the covering of love. He says, never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. If you go to Isaiah chapter 49 verses 8 through 10. Isaiah 49 is a very messianic prophecy talking about the coming of the Messiah. Talking about Jesus. Here's what it says. God says, in the time of my favor I will answer you. Talking to the Messiah. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances, to say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. And now listen to these sentences. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. That's exactly what this is saying, right? He's referring to this passage. This prophecy will come true. The Messiah will extend his umbrella, his tent over you. He will be your shepherd. He will be your guide. He will be your protector. He will provide for you everything you need. You will never hunger or thirst. You will never face pain or suffering anymore. He says he will wipe every tear from your eyes. He says, the lamb will be their shepherd and he will lead them to springs of water. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. The elder here speaking to John, God revealing this to us is saying, all of these things are going to come true. You may go through great trial, great tribulation, great suffering, even persecution and martyrdom for your faith. But at the end of the day, those who maintain their faith in Jesus, all of these promises, all of these prophecies will come true. God extending his care over you. God welcoming you into his kingdom. So as we look at this then, what are the things that we are meant to get from this passage, from these visions of these two crowds and then that conversation with the elder? I believe there are at least three things that we're meant to notice from this today. First of all, I mentioned to you that this is an interlude meant to bring us comfort and encouragement. We're seeing these seals broken and they can be kind of scary things that are happening and we have more things to come that might be even a little bit more scary than what we've already seen in the chapters. But God pauses that uh, event, that progression of events, those seals, to say, remember what happens in the end. Remember what the end picture is going to look like. You will be welcomed into the kingdom. You will worship Jesus and see him face to face. He will be your shepherd. He will be your protector. He will be your Lord. He will be everything that you've ever wanted, anything you've ever needed. He will be there and you will have perfect peace, perfect joy, no more pain, no more suffering. The Lord God will wipe every tear from your eyes. So he gives us this picture of that end time, right, welcoming of the saints into the kingdom. 
and for the apostles and for the church as they go out and are sharing the gospel with others and are being martyred and persecuted for doing so. He says, remember the end time picture. People from every tribe and language, more people than you can count, will be welcomed into the kingdom because you were willing to hold out the gospel in service of Jesus. Because you were willing to stand for the faith, to share Christ's love, to share the gospel, to share the truth with others. There will be people in heaven because you were willing to hold out the light for them to receive and be saved. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep going. So he gives us this big picture here to comfort us, to reassure us, to remind us of the big picture. What it all comes down to is those who are going to be welcomed into the kingdom, the lamb and the father there welcoming them with open arms. Second thing I believe we're meant to take from this is that we're all going to face different trials and tribulations. Now I told you in chapter one that you have to remember the original audience of this letter, right? Original audience of this letter, right? First, second century church here, uh, John being exiled, the church being persecuted, several of them being killed for their faith. They're going through a great tribulation, but did they experience or go through the end of times right before Jesus comes back? No, it still hasn't happened yet. We're still waiting for it, but they face their own tribulation. They face their own difficulties, their own challenges. Will we be part of the generation that experiences the very end right before Jesus comes again? We don't know. But there are going to be trials. There are going to be challenges. There's going to be struggles, whether personal and individual or global or national, that we go through. And God's call to us is the same, to continue to persevere, to continue to be faithful, to continue to do the things that God has called you to do. And so over and over again, we see in this book, in this letter, that message of faithful perseverance, holding on to the faith, doing what God has called us to do, not giving up no matter what happens, no matter the struggles, no matter the sadness, no matter the difficulty, no matter the fears. As we look at and see what is happening in Israel today, we don't know how much that's going to explode or grow or, or increase or if it'll result in more wars. We don't know that. But the call for us is the same, to be faithful, to continue to hold on to Christ, to continue to do the things that he's called us to do. So I asked today, well, what does that look like on a practical level? And I just want to take you back to some of the basics, right? To continue to be in Christ, to continue to maintain a relationship with Christ means spending time in prayer. It's something absolutely essential to our life in Christ. You can't get so busy that you forget to spend time in prayer with Christ, in conversation with our Lord. This should be a daily habit, right, of waking up, of spending time with the Lord. Before you go to bed, spending time with the Lord, having that conversation with Him. Pouring your heart out to God and taking time just to rest and be still before God. To hear what He has to say to you. Same thing with our Bible reading. Right, we cannot afford the luxury of having our Bibles gather dust on the shelf. We have to be digging into God's Word. We have to pick it up. The God of heaven has given you a message, has given you His Word. He wants to speak to you. Will you take the time to read it, to dig into it, to listen to it, to pay attention to it? I have a little journal in my office that I keep every day, and it's got a special section that says, what is God saying to me? And so every day I'll read a section in the scripture, and then I write down, all right, what is it that this passage is saying, and what is God speaking specifically to me through this passage? And so practicing that discernment, practicing just communing with God and hearing from God. So we can't let that go. Being part of the church continuing to fellowship on the Sabbath, to honor and worship God, to hear what God has to say to us through the messages and through the music, continuing to foster those relationships with other believers so that we have a community, a family that we can encourage and help one another when we go through those struggles. These are absolutely essential practices, and these are graces given to us by God to help us remain strong in the faith, to help us remain strong in connection to Christ Jesus. Continuing to walk in obedience to God. Doing the things that God has called us to do. Repenting of the things that we're not meant to do. Continuing to grow in that obedience. To surrender more and more of our life each day to Christ. 
Not because we believe it's those things that save us, but because we are grateful for what Jesus has done to save us through his death on the cross. These are elementary, basic things. I know you've heard a million times, but we cannot take them for granted. We cannot just dismiss them and say, ah, I'm mature enough in the faith, I don't need those things anymore. No, we never outgrow those things. We have to continue. We have to persevere. God wants us to grow and establish deep roots in Him. And so He gives us these things to help us with that. So that call to faithful perseverance. Let me close with the words of John chapter 15, verse 1 through 8. Jesus says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus calls us, urges us, pleads with us. Hold on to him. Hold on to him. There's going to be challenging things that come in your life, challenging things that come in this world. And the only thing that matters, the only thing that's going to keep you whole and safe and sound through those things is your connection to Jesus. And so remain in him. And he reminds us here that he has given us a task has given us a job, a mission, just like we saw in that video, right? A mission of holding out the gospel, of sharing God's truth, God's love, God's word with those around us. He's called us to bear much fruit. And if we're not bearing fruit, then we're not doing what we are designed to do. So we have to continue, persevere, and continue holding out the word, no matter how few or how many respond and accept the gospel, to continue to be the light of Christ that God has called us to be. Would you please bow and pray with me at this time? Jesus, we thank you for these words. We thank you for caring enough about our feelings that uh, even when we see things that you are showing us that are somewhat intimidating and scary, you recognize how they might make us feel. And so you bother to take the time to pause and to tell us, don't be afraid. Don't worry. Trust in me. It's all going to be okay. And so we thank you, Lord, for this picture of these believers that are sealed in the Holy Spirit and of the great multitude that is brought into your kingdom. Lord, it's difficult to put ourselves in John's shoes and what he was going through and how this vision must have made him feel to see that multitude. But help us also, Lord, to understand what that is. That we would stand in awe and amazement at the great work that you're doing right now all around the world to bring new people, new tribes, languages that we haven't even heard of into faith and into salvation. Help us, Lord, not to dismiss our role in that and no matter how young or old we are that we would understand we play a vital part in that. Help us, Lord Jesus, as we go through trials, as we go through difficulties, as we draw closer to the end of all things, to maintain our faith in you. Keep us safe, Lord. Keep us strong. Help us, Lord, to do the things that you've called us to do in prayer and Bible reading and church and fellowship and service and obedience, that these things that you've given us would continue to strengthen us and empower us to be the people that you've called us to be. I pray, Lord Jesus, for us right here in this room, Faith Community Church, that you'd be glorified in us and through us, Lord Jesus. That you'd give us eyes to see and hearts for the nations. That our heartbeat would beat in tune with your heartbeat. God, continue the mighty work that you want to do in our lives, we pray. This time, please join me in praying the Father's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.